Hey guys, welcome to Solo React Talk. Today I'm going to be reacting to Czechoslovakia, the last bastion of democracy between two wars, 1935, part one of four by Time Ghost History. If you want to check out my previous reactions to other Time Ghost History between two wars videos, remember the playlist card will be at the top. Just look on it and you'll be able to access them. If you want to check out the original video as well as Time Ghost History's YouTube channel, the links are in the description below. Okay, let's start. Three, two, one, go. National self-determination is supposed to be what defines the new world order after the Great War, right? You know, like each national group having the freedom to govern themselves and decide their own futures. But what happens when groups find themselves cut in half by new borders? What happens when two of them claim the same region? Are losers of the Great War even allowed to decide their own future? By 1935, the new Republic of Czechoslovakia is experiencing firsthand how lofty ideals of national self-determination are a lot more complicated in the real world. Dobry den, Yasem Indy Naidel. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism and euphoria, and ultimately humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. Like many states across Europe, Czechoslovakia would not have been possible in the 20s and 30s without the Great War. For centuries, the Czech and Slovak lands were controlled respectively by the Austrian Empire and the Kingdom of Hungary, and then both by the Austro-Hungarian Empire from 1867 onward. Now, And, you know, as soon as that empire fell, you know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire fell, that's when uh, you know, uh, Czechoslovakia could break away and make its own little country, if I can say that. Yeah. Hmm. Most Czech nationalists always imagine national autonomy as possible within a federated realm. The introduction of universal male suffrage in 1906 and the Austrian half of the Habsburg Empire meant that national minorities could agitate for reform from within. But the outbreak of war in 1914 changes all of this. Long-standing Russophilism among the Czech and Slovak peoples galvanizes opposition to their rulers, and the alliance between Austria, Hungary, and Germany further alienates them. Slowly but surely, opinion shifts towards seeing autonomy as possible only after the central powers are vanquished. A narrative begins to emerge of the war as an epic struggle between Germans and Slavs. Chaos is a ladder. So, nationalism is gaining ground. But with Austria-Hungary suppressing political freedoms at home, nationalists are forced to operate from abroad. And the man pulling them all together is Tomasz Masaryk. Despite being a well-respected public intellectual, he has previously been a somewhat marginal figure in Czech politics. His Czech progressive party only had one deputy, himself in the pre-war Imperial Council. And his pro-Western leanings have always gone against mainstream Russophilism. In fact, Masaryk does not himself see the war as this epic struggle between Germans and Slavs. He sees it as one of democracy versus theocracy. And there is no doubt that Czech loyalties lie with Lady Liberty. Masaryk sees them drawn from the traditions of humanism, religion, and democracy, supposedly associated with the 15th century Hussite movement. Though his beliefs often center on Czech themes, Masaryk is also a promoter of Czech and Slovak unity. He was born in a border region to a mixed family. He speaks a hybrid of the two languages, and he's already garnered a fair amount of Slovaks loyal to his cause. So what is he doing for the cause of the Czech, or rather Czechoslovak, nation? Well, he left Prague in December 1914 to gauge international opinion on the matter. This earned him the ire of the Habsburgs, and he was warned that he would face execution if he returned to his homeland. Despite not really having any claim to legitimacy, he declares the Czechoslovak National Council in Paris, November 1915. Though there is only one other actually elected politician alongside him, Masaryk does get representatives of Czech and Slovak organizations throughout Europe and North America to sign his manifesto. And I'm assuming they signed this manifesto in France. You know, France is now holding, or should I say is hosting this uh, Czechoslovakia uh, freedom movement, you know, they're holding it in France. And yeah, that, that's quite interesting. I wonder how many other, you know, political 
refugees, political dissidents, you know, uh, escaped their own home countries wherever they're trying to, you know, uh, garner support for the independence of their people, uh, left and headed over to either France or maybe Britain, you know, to uh, request asylum or uh, safety, you know, from their own homelands where probably their governments want to kill them or they want to extradite them so that they can stand trial for treason, you know. Um, so I find it quite interesting that, you know, France uh, was holding this... Uh, I don't want to say it's a government yet, you know, maybe like a government in exile, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm, I just find it so interesting that, you know, France has been hosting these organizations uh, in their country and, you know, there doesn't seem to be any type of backlash, you know, from the Austro-Hungarian uh, empire. Yeah. Hmm. And working closely with him is Edvard Benesch. Like Masaryk, he comes from an academic background, though he doesn't have nearly as much public fame. He will, however, come to play a crucial role in Czechoslovak politics. Masaryk's National Council do everything possible to champion the cause of Czechoslovakia. This mainly takes the form of persuading foreign countries that Czech and Slovak independence is in the best interests of the West. Talks are given and pamphlets are published declaring that with their innate inclination towards democracy, a free Czech and Slovak nation would serve as a bastion of liberty in Central Europe, guarding against Germanic militarism. But even by 1918, an independent Czechoslovakia is not inevitable. In January, the British government announced that while they support the right to national self-determination, they have no intention of dividing the territory of the Central Powers. See, with communism on the rise after the Russian revolutions, the Allies are pretty reluctant to let the region balkanize into numerous weak states. Though public opinion in Europe and America looks approvingly at the Czechoslovak soldiers, they fought bravely on the Western, Eastern, and Italian fronts as Czechoslovak legions. Still, in the summer and autumn of 1918, the National Council is recognized as the Czechoslovak government in waiting by the Allied powers. Government in waiting. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. The Czechoslovak National Committee is set up by veteran politician Karel Kramarsz in July to organize the movement and ready an administration for the soon-to-be state. Empowered now by clear domestic and international support, Masaryk drafts a Czechoslovak Declaration of Independence from Washington, D.C. on October 18th. Will there be elections or are they just going to declare themselves as leaders of this new nation? Uh, yeah, because they say that they're a democracy, but I don't know. Are, are they going to have elections in Czechoslovakia to, you know, formally approve them as, uh, you know, the leaders of the nation? Hmm. Or maybe like this is like an interim uh, government until they can have proper elections. Yeah, maybe it's something like that. It promises universal suffrage, freedom of thought and expression, gender equality, and equal rights to national minorities. Later that month, Kramarsh National Committee passes its first law. The independent Czechoslovak state has come into being. Just a few days later, Kramarsh and Benesh meet in Geneva to thrash out who holds ultimate responsibility. They decide that Masaryk will be president, Kramarsh premier, and Benesh foreign minister. So there we have it. Less than two weeks later, Austria-Hungary collapses and Czechoslovakia is proclaimed via a provisional constitution. Masaryk finally returns home again on December 20th as President Liberator. It has been a mostly bloodless revolution in the midst of one of the bloodiest wars in history. But... <laughs> Did you see in the night? <laughs> and his face is like, mm hmm but... <laughs> oh gosh. Just because it came about relatively peacefully does not mean that it has guaranteed stability. Ethnic Germans have thrown their lot in with the newly proclaimed German Austria. Political leaders set up rival administrative bodies and declare border areas to be autonomous regions within the Austrian Republic. In reaction, Prague sends in its army to ensure peace, ironically borrowing repressive measures from the Austrian legal code that had been used to combat Slav nationalism. Germans are prosecuted for draft evasion, espionage, 
and the slandering of Czechoslovakia's honor. A siege mentality soon emerges. In one instance, the autonomous regional government in Bohemia orders that no beer should be sold to the occupiers. Things reach ahead on March 4th. Czechoslovak authorities have blocked any involvement with elections in Austria. In reaction, German leaders call for a mass demonstration the day the Reichsrat is scheduled to convene. Tens of thousands of Germans attend demonstrations across the borderlands. Tensions inevitably mount, and the day ends in tragedy as Czechoslovak troops fire on the massed protesters. The bloodiest incident is at Kadania, where a standoff between nearly 10,000 protesters and the army over the flying of the German flag results in two minutes of indiscriminate machine gun fire from either side of the town square. 22 people are shot and killed in that square. All in all, 54 Germans are killed and hundreds more are wounded. But this is not the only border conflict taking place. On the other side, Hungarians are pretty unhappy about losing Slovakia, which they call Upper Hungary, occupying it on the day of the armistice. With diplomatic assistance from France, though, and military assistance from Italy, the Czechoslovak legions managed to force the Hungarians back across the border by mid-January. Still another displeased group are Poles, who form a majority in the Silesian Duchy of Tessin and want to join the new Polish Republic. Oh, wow. Okay, so Czechoslovakia has minorities that, you know, want to pull away and probably connect with their mother body nations germany poland that's also been created uh and you know now they also have hungary from the southern regions of the country trying to invade into their country like i'm just amazed that the country is still kind of keeping itself whole you know throughout all of this uh turmoil and and, si and situations of separation you know people uh, demanding their own independency or, or to join uh, a far bigger nation you know closer to their border you know um, so yeah I'm, I'm quite amazed that Czechoslovakia is still containing itself uh, as a state yeah hmm. while all this is going on Benish is working as chief negotiator at the Paris peace conference to secure Czechoslovakia's borders he even uses the tragic protests of March 4th to strengthen his position, claiming that they were initiated by Vienna and that with the border regions firmly in the hands of Czechoslovakia, Germanic imperialism can be neutered. The Commission on the Czechoslovak Questions agrees, declaring that the separation of all areas inhabited by German Bohemians would not only expose Czechoslovakia to great dangers, but equally create great difficulties for the Germans themselves. Other territorial questions are settled in Paris, and Benesch walks away victorious. Pretty much all of his aims have been fulfilled. And the yes, they've been fulfilled, but now what happens uh, to the uh, those who identify themselves as Germans in Czechoslovakia? What happens to them now? You know, um, I, I don't think the, Czech, the Czechoslovakian government is going to do anything like oppressive against, you know, the Germans... Uh, who live in their country uh, because you know they've stated that they want to make a democratic nation universal suffrage you know uh, have everyone having uh, rights you know human rights so I don't think it's going to be an issue of the government you know trying to suppress the people but you know maybe maybe they'll just feel like they don't really belong in this country called Czechoslovakia, you know, because it's dominated by these uh, two uh, 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 cultural groupings of people, you know, and it doesn't involve them because now they are in minority. I don't know, but I just don't see this ending well. Mm. Borders of Czechoslovakia are now secure, but neat lines on maps do not show the patchwork of ethnicities beneath them. The largest demographic in this country is, of course, Czechs, who number around 7 million people. And then obviously there are the Slovaks, who are approximately 2 million. Smaller groups of Hungarians, Poles, Ruthenians also add to the mix. But ethnic Germans, the majority of whom are at the very least bitter that they are now ruled by a Slav majority, number over 3 million and are the second largest demographic. 
Oh wow! I thought <laughs> I thought it was the the Czechoslovakians who are you know having the largest population numbers in the country, but it's also the Germans. The Germans are uh, second place. That's oof. That's that's very worrying. Um, yeah, it's not going to go well. It's definitely not going to go well. I think. Despite the tension bubbling beneath the surface, Masaryk and Benes continue to forge the Czechoslovak state. A permanent constitution is approved by the Provisional Assembly in February 1920. Parliamentary elections are held in April, and the new National Assembly confirms Masaryk as president in May. Throughout the 1920s, there is undeniably political stability, though some might call it stasis. Of course, like, like friggin' everywhere, there are threats from the extreme left and extreme right. But these are actually relatively ineffectual here. Far more ominous is the continual dissatisfaction of ethnic Germans, who are increasingly coming to recognize themselves as Sudeten Germans. This term has only just come into existence. Previously, they would have thought of themselves as German Bohemians, German Moravians, or just Germans. But the term is growing in popularity, and German newspapers are promoting it to convey a sense of a unified national minority struggling against a Slav majority. Such illusions of victimhood make ideal breeding ground for Nazism. The German National Socialist Party was established in Czechoslovakia in 1919, and is basically a carbon copy of its Weimar Germany counterpart, right down to the banners and uniforms. This should have been banned as as soon as you know the government realized that this organization was existing in the in the country. It should have been banned, you know, because now Germany has a bit of a foothold in Czechoslovakia through uh, this new organization. That's uh, uh, you know part of the what, what do they call themselves? The German Sudeten Sudeten Germans. Yes, you know. Uh, it's now going to become like a proxy for Germany. And I don't know whether they're going to use them militarily or politically, but it's not going to end well for the Czechoslovakian government, you know, keeping stability uh, in the country. Yeah. This is not to say that all Germans in Czechoslovakia are foaming at the mouth ultra-nationalists. In the 1920 elections, the German Social Democrat Party gained 11% of the vote to become the second largest party in parliament. Other parties like, like the German Agrarian Party, the German Christian Social People's Party, they also work with like-minded Czechs and Slovaks. They, they all desire autonomy, but they seek it within the framework of the Czechoslovak state. And such political participation is promising. In fact, German politicians even produced two cabinet ministers in 1926. Sudeten Germans now have people representing them in the halls of power. And on the international stage, Benish is doing everything he can to keep Czechoslovakia secure. In 1921, he crafts the little entente between Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Yugoslavia to guard against Hungarian revanchism. Together, these countries achieve a sort of great power status in international diplomacy. At the same time, Benes has been normalizing relations with Poland, attempting to move beyond the tension that emerged during both republics' establishment. He also fosters close ties with France, but is careful not to let his country fall into any real bloc, making Czechoslovakia a model member of the League of Nations. Things are still pretty tense with Germany, though. The Treaty of Locarno in 1925 results in Germany recognizing its western borders as permanent, not its eastern ones. Chancellor Gustav Stresemann has effectively refused to recognize the German Czechoslovak border. But Benish does manage to get an arbitration treaty signed between the two countries and also gains assurances of military aid from France in the event of German invasion. And so in the latter half of the 1920s, things are looking pretty good. The mineral-rich lands escaped significant war damage while also inheriting the bulk of Austria-Hungary's industrial capacity. Farmland across the country is also fertile. By, by 1929, industrial production exceeds pre-war levels by 40%, and agriculture has grown by 28%. And the healthy economy allows for an impressive record on social welfare. Let and this is before the economic collapse, the global economic uh, collapse, right? Yeah. So right now they're having their little golden age uh, of prosperity. 
and then calamity occurs. Hmm. Legislation for sickness and accident insurance is passed in 1924 with some pretty generous provisions and liberal pension laws are passed in 1926. But like everywhere else, the worldwide depression will catch up with Czechoslovakia and trigger widespread unrest. By 1932, foreign trade has virtually collapsed and there is crisis in credit and agriculture. Consumption and standards of living are falling while unemployment is rising. The government is forced to cut back on spending. Radical moods are on the rise. Hunger marches and strikes are increasing and the far left and far right are growing in strength. Czechoslovakia has managed to cling to the democratic traditions that have been central to its establishment. And a large part of this is thanks to Masaryk. As president liberator, he has been a unifying force, projecting stability while nations all around are falling to authoritarian regimes. But even his presence is unable to ward off the specter of German nationalism. So far, Sudetans have voted overwhelmingly for democratic parties. But the Sudetenland has been walloped by the depression, and this, along with Hitler's rise in Germany, means that resentment is rising. Patriotic educational, cultural, and sport organizations are set up, and Germans are moving further and further towards the nationalist right. In 1932, membership of the recently established Volkssport, the Czech version of the SA, surges from 5,000 to 40,000. Emboldened, they marched through Sudeten streets, belting out the Nazi anthem, the Horst Wessel song. Czech authorities once again adopt repressive measures. In July 1933, the National Assembly passes a law banning newspapers dangerous to the state. And in October, another law authorizes the suppression of subversive political parties. The German National Social Party is dissolved, along with the less outwardly Nazi, but still pretty nationalistic German National Party. But a new organization has been established by Konrad Henlein, previously an obscure gymnastic instructor, called the Sudeten German Patriotic Front. Members of the banned parties join Henlein's organization in droves. Now, his relationship to Nazism is admittedly a little complicated. His own priorities seem to lie more with Sudeten Germans rather than anything explicitly pan-Germanist in some but I'm sure he's not you know he's not picky when it comes to allies you know if Germany is going to give him support in any type of way he will accept it uh, and he will say that it's for his Sudeten uh, Germans in Czechoslovakia but ultimately in the end you know this is all going to be for the benefit of uh, Germany and their ambitions of taking over uh, you know, those lands and Czechoslovakia as a whole. So, you know, he might think that he's, he's going to be using German uh, support for his own ends, but the Germans are using him <laughs> for their own ends. Uh, so, yeah. In speeches, he even talks of Czech and Sudeten reconciliation, provided the injustices against the latter are righted. So, as not to appear too subversive, he often has to affirm his commitment to liberal democracy. This is, though, not much more than a veneer, and his fascist sympathies are somewhat obvious. He relies on folkish themes, often talking of a Volkgemeinschaft, and styles himself as a Sudeten Führer. And while the strength of the German nationalist is growing, the health of the president liberator is slowly weakening. Narrowly surviving a stroke in May 1934, Masaryk's entire left side is paralyzed. He resolves to seek re-election once his term ends, but only so that he can name Benesch as his successor. But new parliamentary elections are coming up in May 1935, and Henlein is a clear threat. He renames his growing party the Sudeten German Party and campaigns fiercely. Some politicians see the danger and ask Masaryk to authorize a ban of the party. But the president is reluctant, believing Henlein will become more moderate upon entering parliament. If he knew... How do you know that? How do you know? Hey, that's a big gamble. Where Henlein is getting his money from, he might not have been so cautious. As I said, as I said, he, the Germans are here. They are here. They will support this political party to make it as a proxy in their ambitions to take over Czechoslovakia, yeah.
With some difficulty and in circumstances not entirely clear, Henlein has secured funding from Nazi Germany itself. And this money no doubt contributes towards his stunning success. The election reveals just how radicalized the German population has become in the short space of five years. Henlein's party gets 66% of the German vote. That's 15.2% of the nationwide vote. With 44 seats, they are now the largest party in the Chamber of Deputies. Meanwhile, the moderate German parties have been decimated. The Social Democrats are reduced to almost half their 1929 strength. Henlein also has no intention of serving in the government, meaning any coalition can only ever rule through a minority cabinet. Masaryk's gamble on choosing not to ban him has backfired. The parliamentary system of this young democracy is undeniably still intact, but a shadow has been cast over it. Masaryk formally abdicates in December, with Benish just about being approved as his successor. Immediately, he sets about drawing up plans to guard his country against the rising Nazi menace that now has so much support at home. Since 1933, Czechoslovakia has been the only functioning democracy in Central and Eastern Europe, and in many ways, it has lived up to the promises made for it by Masaryk and Benesh. Its democratic culture has been relatively healthy, and its people peaceful. It could even be said that it captures all the ideals of the post-war settlement, promising a new Europe made up of free nation-states. But it is equally true that from its creation, its second largest population has been resentful that it has been forced to live in such a state. The bitterness of the Sudetans has been simmering away beneath the surface from the beginning, and the cataclysmic worldwide changes of the 1930s have now brought them to the boiling point. Time will tell if this young democracy will be able to guard against the Nazi threat from both without and within. If you'd like to learn about another state born from the ashes of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and all the difficulties that entailed, then check out, sorry, check out our two-parter on interwar Yugoslavia. You can click on the first episode right about here, coming any minute now. Our patron of the week is Sean Facello. It is because of our Patreon subscribers that we can continue making quality historical content such as this. So do like Sean and subscribe to us at patreon.com or at timeghost.tv. And remember guys, even in the darkest times, you can still always do this. Prosim vas, pane, ještě jedno pivo. Děkuji. Na zdraví. Na zhledanou. Okay, guys, that's it with the Czechoslovakia, the last bastion of democracy between two wars, 1935, part one of four, by Time Ghost History. Um, yeah, Mas Masaryk, um, yeah, Masaryk and uh, Bernish, you know, they really tried uh, to make this uh, dream come become a reality, and it worked. Uh, Czechoslovakia came into being uh, after the dissolution of the Austria-Hungarian. Uh, uh, empire and yes all seemed well you know until the situation with uh, the German population that live within the nation uh, became a very serious situation you know where now many of them have this victim mentality victimhood mentality and you know they resent the fact that they are under the command or should I say they're under the leadership of a Czechoslovakian state you know and it's not as if they didn't have the right to vote they didn't have uh, public representatives in the halls of government you know they even had ministers uh, in the cabinets uh, of Czechoslovakia so they had representation they had people there uh, who would represent the interests of those who called themselves uh, Sudeten Germans, you know. However, uh, the next door neighbor to Czechoslovakia, Germany, um, has already planted its proxy political parties, its proxy, uh, uh, you know, organizations, and, you know, they've instilled themselves in the psyche of the Sudeten Germans. Um, yes, they started out small, 
but that's you know as soon as they started out or existing in Czechoslovakia the government should have stamped them out of out of existence you know to make sure that there is no influence from Germany um, but they didn't they allowed them to grow as a political entity um, and you know yes they were disbanded but then those that were disbanded now went and created a new party and that new party was further funded and supported by uh, the German government and yeah it's just it's just not going to end up well uh, for Czechoslovakia uh, later down the line I think you know um, but yeah it, it's it's an interesting situation that has happened to Czechoslovakia I, I don't know why but I it just kind of reminds me of Yugoslavia in some sort of way you know where they in Yugoslavia they also had a leader who wanted to keep his nation you know as one but there were so many opposing forces that were pulling the, the country in different paths you know and something similar is happening in Czechoslovakia where you know they're being attacked by the Hungarians in the south they are being uh, you know pulled in the north by Germany and its proxy uh, uh, entities and you know they're literally trying to keep themselves together and they've kept themselves together for a very long time uh, due to Masaryk and to Bernic you know and now that Masaryk is gone or he has retired because of his uh, ill health uh, Bernic is the only one there we don't know how long will he last you know how long will he be able to uh, keep the center hold you know hold the center uh, uh, as a complete government as a complete nation we don't know how long um but yeah it's just interesting to see a bit of a similarity with uh, yugoslavia and uh, czechoslovakia yeah hmm. okay guys i guess that's it for tonight with time goes history if you want to check out the original video as well as time goes history's youtube channel the links are in the description below if you like my reaction please give me a like comment and subscribe to my channel click on the notification bell if you want to be up to date with my latest videos and i'll see you guys next week tuesday okay good night